whether to obey the commands of the sovereign or whether in their own judgment doing so would be dangerous to them. And so if each subject, is that not clear? Right? I mean, these passages are suggesting that there's an inalienable right to self-defense. And that includes disobeying the sovereign's commands if that's dangerous. And my question is a simple one. Whose judgment concerning the danger of obedience are we relying on? Not the sovereign's. It has to be each individual. And so, each individual, in these passages, Hobbes is saying, each individual relies on his or her own judgment to determine whether to comply with the sovereign's commands or whether it's too dangerous. And if each individual is relying on his or her own judgment to determine what to do, we don't have to solve it. So this little thread about inalienable rights, even if it's limited to self-defense, really threatens to unravel the whole construction. Because the whole construction is based on giving up our right to judge for ourselves. Giving up our right to, to judge for ourselves what's good. Simply relying on someone else's judgment for right reason. And Hobbes, Hobbes can't quite bring himself to require that we fully give up our right to judge value for ourselves. if this wasn't enough, uh, look back, look, look again on 145. This is the last passage I talked about. Um, on 145, right after he's talking about the right to disobey the commands of the sovereign if you think they're dangerous, he's right back again talking about the case we talked about before with prisoners of war, where you are bound, if you are a prisoner of war, and you promise that you will send a ransom once you are released and you can get back home. Hobbes is insisting that you are bound by that. You are bound by that. So if a subject be taken prisoner of war, or his person or his means of life be within the guards of the enemy, and hath his life and corporal liberty given to him, so we spare your life on the condition that on, on the condition to be subject to the victor, he hath liberty to accept the condition, and having accepted it, is the subject of him that took him, because he had no other way of preserving himself. If a man be held in prison or bonds, or is not trusted with the liberty of his body, um, then um, he's allowed to try to escape. So if there's an agreement made, you really are bound by that covenant, by that commitment. And yet, I don't know. Uh, I want to say that if you're taken prisoner of war, you make a covenant to be obedient to the one who makes you uh, takes you prisoner. They release you so that there's no future uh, uh, obligation on the part of the captor. They release you, so they fill their end of the covenant. Well, then you are bound by the valid covenant that you've made. You've become subject. And so they let you go. You are still bound. You wander off. And now it's up to you to decide whether they're still protecting you. And if not, well, then you're not bound anymore. So I say one more time. Hobbes, I think, can't quite bring himself to require us fully to surrender our judgment. And the judgment about what's valuable is something that um, isn't quite something.
certainly a moving forward transfer. Okay, um, so let's think about the big picture for Hobbes here, um, the overall strategy here. Um, and the first thing, of course, uh, is his underlying subjectivism about value. Um, so there's, for him, um, Nothing is valuable, nothing is good in itself, you remember, but is made good for a person by that person having a desire for it. So when a person desires for it, that is, when there's a physical vibration in the person that leads them toward acquiring that thing, that's what it means for that thing to be good for that person. So this is deeply connected to Hobbes's materialism. This is deeply committed to his natural scientific picture of the world, where there are no ends, no natural ends, and therefore no natural goodness. <coughs> the world fundamentally is, the, the, the world that Hobbes gives us is fundamentally the naturalistic scientific picture of the world. But he notices that human beings and other creatures do desire things. We do have ends which we take to be good. And so that's the source of the subjective value that gets introduced into this naturalistic causal picture. Clear? second point, then, is his instrumental reason. That is, we only have reason to do something when it's either, we only have reason to do something that either we have a desire for, and therefore we think it's good, or something that will bring about something that we have a desire for, instrumentally. And so I want you to notice that there are really two parts to this account of instrumental reasoning. One is an affirmation, an affirmation that reason really can do something. This is not a denial of reason altogether. It can do something. It can tell us to do something. Namely, when we have an end or a goal, reason tells us we should take the necessary means to achieve. Reason tells us that when we have a goal, when we have an end, when there's something that we desire, we have a reason to do what are the necessary steps to bring that about. Say it the other way around. We're be, the, on this account, we're being irrational. If we desire something, we take something to be good, but don't take the correct strategy to bring it about. If we have a desire that we want to satisfy, but we don't follow the correct steps to bring in the causal steps. We, we, we do something that causes something else, not the end that we desire. We're making a mistake. So if I have a desire to um, um, uh, drink a Coca-Cola, that's an end that I have, I have a desire for that. And I go outside and I look up at the sky and open my mouth waiting for Coca-Cola to appear from the sky. I'm not taking a rational strategy toward my end. So reason on this view really can tell us something. Given our end, it tells us what to do to bring it about. But, on the other hand, instrumental account also tells us that we cannot establish the value of our ends. Reason alone cannot establish the ends as being valuable. Those are simply given by the things that we happen to like, given by our desires. So for Hobbes, our ends, our values, are given by our desires. Um, and we can figure out with reason how best to go about satisfying those desires and achieving power of good. And morality is how we do that. Or maybe 
justice is how we do that. So morality comes on the scene and is given an instrumental justification by arguing that by putting ourselves under moral constraints, we will better be able to satisfy our subjective desires. So morality is given an instrumental justification, tells us that the desires that we happen to have will better be satisfied by taking this path, this causal sequence. Notice on this view, um, we get an account of what is valuable. We get an account of the good. We get an account of goodness. In Hobbes' case, a subjective account. Um, before we introduce morality. Let me say that again, it's very important for Kant. On Hobbes' view, the sort of overall structure of the argument starts with an account of what is good or valuable. In this case, it's a subjective account of the satisfaction of, the, of my desires is good for me. We first understand what's good or valuable. And then we give an instrumental justification for morality in terms of morality's ability to bring about that good end. In my case, uh, morality's ability to bring about that good end is morality's ability to bring about <coughs> what? So, we've been talking about today problems with this view, but put them aside. What's he trying to do? I provide for you the preservation of your Right. So, Hobbes's, the structure of Hobbes' argument is supposed to show me that by putting myself under moral constraints, I will better satisfy my desire. I'll better achieve my good, what I think is good. And same for you. So we get an instrumental justification of morality in terms of each person's subjective um, And so I'll uh, stop just by pointing to the underlying paradox once again. Um, the, the argument is that if everybody acts on their desires, nobody will do very well at satisfying their desires. And therefore, everyone will better satisfy their desires, better achieve their subjective conception of good, if they give up the right to act on their desires. And so that's the sort of paradoxical argument that Hobbes makes here. So one last time. Uh, if everybody is simply acting on their subjective values, because they are subjective, they will come into conflict with one another, and nobody will be able to satisfy their subjective values very well. So what we need to do, he says, is give up the right to act on our subjective desires, take someone else's judgment about value to be correct, as if it were, as if their judgment of value were objectively correct substitute their subjective judgment for all of ours, and each of us will do better in terms of satisfying our own original desires, our original subjective desires, by substituting someone else's for ours. Okay, so, very last point. You might think this is crazy. I mean, I called this a paradox here. So on Monday, we'll explore a little bit of a sort of formal situation that I hope makes it look a little bit less crazy.